In this video, I'll be ranking 21 controversial fitness topics as either overrated or underrated. I'm having my friend and past coach, Dr. Lane Norton, join me for some credibility points since he has a PhD in nutritional sciences and is a pro natural bodybuilder and powerlifter himself. Now I'm giving us 15 seconds each to explain why we ranked each item the way we did, and we'll be covering four categories, training, nutrition, supplementation, and hot fitness topics. Here we go. The first category is training, training to failure. Bodybuilders tend to overemphasize how important going to failure is, when in reality you just have to be reasonably close to failure, usually within a couple reps of it. I think it's useful to go to failure from time to time so you know what it feels like, but you can get pretty much the same benefits of training to failure by stopping a few reps shy. Sumo deadlifts. I, I think underrated. <laughs> <laughs> we might be a little Lately. biased here. Fair enough. For me, the reason I do it is because it spares my lower back a little bit because I have such long legs that a conventional really hunches me over and puts quite a bit of fatigue on my lower back and with as much as I squat, it's pretty difficult. From a muscle activation standpoint, there is very, very little difference between sumo and conventional. So it's just individual. Full range of motion. Ooh. <laughs> so I'm going to say underrated because I think there's a lot of people who train with partial range of motion because they feel uncomfortable getting into that kind of oh crap range of motion like say on a squat where you're about halfway down and your body goes mm. oh crap. We have shown that full range of motion or at least training in the, in the stretched position appears to be critical for maximizing hypertrophy. So I say underrated. But I say overrated at least within I think the more savvy fitness crowd because I think they put it on a pedestal when in reality what's most important is getting to the stretched aspect of the lift and through the yeah. hardest part of the lift yeah. at least from a hypertrophic standpoint. But yeah. without that extra nuance I would say yeah just doing half reps is not optimal. Powerlifting for bodybuilding. I'm going to say underrated and only from the perspective of low reps can still build muscle and there's no real research to indicate this but when you get stronger and you're able to use more weight in a higher rep range that's more progressive overload and I think just varying up your reps in general is a great idea. I would say the same thing in reverse from powerlifting to do some higher up training from time to time as well. Yeah, I completely agree. I don't think it's like necessary for bodybuilders, but I think it can be helpful. For me, I've found powerlifting helpful as an objective outlet because as a natural bodybuilder, you're not gonna see physique progress from you know month to month or even year to year in some cases. And so focusing on a strength outcome in the form of the power lifts can be really helpful for motivation as well. I agree. Lifting straps. I'm gonna say underrated because if you're not competing in powerlifting or strongman specifically, where you worry about grip strength, grip strength can be a limiter, especially on rows and pull-ups and those sorts of things. And you may actually end up using suboptimal technique Totally agree. Also, from a bodybuilding standpoint, I get a much better mind-muscle connection with my back when I use straps on back exercises. And when I want to train my forearms, I can train my forearms separately. I agree. The second category is nutrition, the post-workout anabolic window. Yeah, I think people think it's really important, like you won't make gains if you skip your post-workout meal. In reality, it's the tip of the iceberg. The total daily protein intake is, is far more important. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the research, it's probably a good idea to get some high quality protein and carbohydrate post-training, but this idea that you have to get it down within the first 30 seconds of finishing your training, there's just no research to support that. If you have a pre-workout meal an hour or two before you work out, and you work out for an hour or two, then just have your next meal an hour or two after that, and it kind of fits your meal space and that's perfectly fine. Liver slash organ meats. It is a nutritious food. It has a lot of vitamins and minerals, but so do fruits and vegetables. Again, I wouldn't put it on a pedestal. You know, it's a source of high quality protein and has vitamins and minerals. Also, you could just take away shake and take vitamins and minerals. So <laughs> uh, rather than having to eat, you know, yeah. liver, at the end of the day, you can get the same to. nutrients from, from somewhere else. Yeah. Detoxing easy. This one's easy. What are we detoxing? So whenever people make claims of detox, I'm always like, so what specific compounds are we detoxing? How are we detoxing them? And how does this not already done by the liver and kidneys? People don't usually have a response to that. Yeah, that's exactly it. The liver and kidneys already do the detoxing. It's, it's not going to help you lose weight if you think it's going to do that either. Well, you. most detoxes are like, here, take this thing, which is actually some kind of laxative. They lose 10 pounds from crapping and not eating. And they're like, oh, wow, I lost weight. Yeah, well. Kiwi fruit. 
No. It's fruit, so it's got vitamins and minerals and you no know, great source of fiber and whatnot and some sweet taste, very nutritious. But I'm gonna say this for most individual foods. I just don't think there's any like one necessary food. So a lot of times for individual foods, I'll just say overrated. That's fair. I mean, I, I mostly agree. I think it does have some good sleep enhancing properties. There are a few studies that have shown improved sleep from kiwis, more vitamin C than almost any other fruit you could name per calorie. Tastes good, different options. You've got the sun gold, you've got the original green, green kiwi. I think underrated relative to more popular fruits like apples, oranges, bananas, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but I agree, no, no food should be put on a pedestal. I, I do agree with that. Oh man's a big fan of kiwis. I like, like it, yeah. Eating clean. Easy. First off, what's the objective definition of clean? If you talk to a vegan, they're gonna tell you meat is not clean. If you talk to a carnivore, they're gonna tell you vegetables aren't clean. There's no objective definition. And even when you get into things that seem like obvious, like a high sugar diet compared to a low sugar diet when you're equating calories, there's actually no difference in body composition at least. So I, I would say it's very overrated. And actually I've seen a lot of people kind of develop weird food relationships because of this idea of eating clean. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I have nothing to add. The third category is supplements, turkesterone. Overrated, it is almost entirely popular because of social media hype, which I think it got because it sounds like testosterone. If it had a more boring name, it yeah. would not be nearly as popular. And also it has serious quality control issues. Oh yeah. Which is a big problem. You yeah. don't really know what you're taking. Yeah. It doesn't increase mTOR. It doesn't increase muscle protein synthesis. There's no receptor in the muscle cell for it. And it doesn't appear to impact muscle protein breakdown. I don't think it does anything. Branch chain amino acids. So this is something I've changed my mind on. I used to promote branched amino acid products. I used to have branched amino acids in my former supplement line. Now I don't have many more because circa 2017, 2018, I changed my thoughts on this because I just saw enough overwhelming evidence that if you get enough high quality protein, that adding BCAAs on top of that just doesn't do anything. Yeah, I agree. Do you think that the pendulum has swung the opposite way where it's like in the science-based community that are like BCAAs are never, ever, ever worth taking? I ever? think there's certain and, and situations where they, they can be useful. Like if you're a, a vegan and you can't get enough protein in, BCAAs can enhance the protein quality you're having. And even there is some evidence that they decrease delayed onset muscle soreness. Whether or not that's independent of total protein intake, we don't know, but there could be some applications. Fair enough. Overall overrated though. Essential amino acids. I say, I say like properly rated. I think they're better than BCAAs. You, you yeah. need all nine essential amino acids to yeah. build muscle tissue. So like almost by definition, they are better. I'd kind of go back, like if you're training fasted, which is not really fast if you take EAs, but mm. if you're training fasted or you don't do well with a lot on your stomach when you go into training, you train in the mornings, maybe something like that gets you out of catabolism without putting too much on your stomach. Yeah. But, but overall I would, overrated. I would, still say overrated. I, I, would say, I would say overrated too. For yeah. the cost. Yeah, yeah. Creatine monohydrate. Barely underrated. I'm gonna say it's underrated because it's not very sexy to most folks because of oh, a boring old creatine monohydrate. And there's so many people now these days who all get comments like, oh yeah, I never used creatine. Uh, I didn't know it was that good. And it's like, I think because it's so ubiquitous, it's become kind of boring. Yeah. And that's why I think it's underrated. And it is the most effective, safe supplement that we have on the market. We have over three decades of research to show that. Yeah, I would say it's properly rated. I feel like people mm. think creatine works and it does work. On the other hand, I think it's not that special. Like you do get a relatively small boost from it. Correct. Right? People take creatine and be like, oh, I'm going to blow up now. Like everything's, and it's like, no, you're looking at very, very small changes. However, it does, it is one of the very few that does work. The basic form of it, the yes. most mainstream form of it is the one that is most effective. So in that sense, it is underrated, I would say. Don't waste your money on any other type. No. Testosterone boosters. For two reasons. One, most don't work. And two, there are some that cause very modest increases in testosterone, very small increases in testosterone. Small increases in testosterone in the physiological range are not gonna actually lead to better gains. You really need a massive change in testosterone to have changes in muscle mass. If you look at like anabolic steroids, I mean, these are raising testosterone levels like multiple fold higher than your natural level. Yeah, I say if you're buying your testosterone booster over the counter, it's probably not doing much for you. Sorry guys. Ashwagandha. 
So I'm gonna say underrated only because I haven't seen that many people talk about it. And there's some pretty compelling research that it acts through multiple different mechanisms yeah. to improve recovery, strength, a little bit of testosterone, yeah. who cares, and possibly even muscle mass. So yeah. I, I do think it's underrated right now. I do too, and also it seems to have a pretty profound effect on anxiety. I mean, not in comparison to like anxiety yeah. lowering medication, but like as a herb, it seems to be pretty powerful. Reduces I'd say stress, adaptogen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it seems to have multiple different pathways that yeah. it helps. The fourth and final category is hot fitness topics, ice baths. I am convinced that this is mostly just to look cool. Remember how like doing cardio on a step mill with a dark hoodie and the hoodie pulled up, somehow it's gonna make you burn more fat. Yeah. This is that version of that. Now, it does decrease the late onset muscle soreness. It may help improve recovery a little bit, but it also attenuates hypertrophy. It attenuates muscle protein synthesis and hypertrophy over the long term. It is yes. bad, for, it is objectively bad for muscle growth. So yes. it's not a good idea to do it if you want to, are trying to build maximum muscle. Yeah. I think bodybuilders are just masochists. They like pain and this is another way to induce that. It just looks cool. Sauna. I will say there is some evidence that suggests that sauna can actually reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So that might be a, a possible benefit, but for building muscle, for body composition, it's not gonna do anything. Is there something to the heat shock proteins? This is the buzzword that I hear. So again, this is where you focus on mechanisms. You don't yeah. look at the human outcome data. So yes, heat shock proteins, if you activate them, can lead to more muscle protein synthesis. But if that was actually making a tangible impact, you would see it in increases in lean body mass. And there are randomized control trials now looking at sauna, showing no increases in muscle Mass. Gotcha, okay. If you want to do it though, you, you can. It, it's, it yeah. doesn't seem to be harmful like the ice baths. It's yeah. just overrated. Like the and hype it, doesn't match the evidence. Yeah, and it may yeah. actually help a little bit with recovery and right. whatnot. Right. Fasted cardio. So again, uh, people will say, well, it increases fat oxidation. You burn, you burn more fat. Yeah, and it doesn't actually lead to more fat loss. So what do you care? Do you care about fat burning or do you care about loss of actual body fat? Because those are two different things. Yeah. We have several randomized control trials now with equal calories equating work and showing fasted or fed doesn't make a difference. And, and I think that's the key. If you like to get out of bed and fasted cardio wakes you up yeah, and it fine. creates a better workout for you, it's perfectly fine, but it, isn't, it doesn't seem to be special in any way. And in fact, there's research also showing that if you burn more fat or oxidize more fat during the cardio session, you oxidize less throughout the course of the day. So it all basically The 24 balances hour out. net is yeah. no difference. Yeah. Body fat spot reduction. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen compelling evidence that you can spot reduce body fat. You'll find some isolated studies that are sponsored by supplement companies that show something, but in terms of independent stuff, I've never seen anything compelling. If it's a trouble spot, that's the last place it's gonna come from. That's it, you just have to continue to get leaner, continue to lose weight and continue to lose fat overall. And doing crunches isn't going to target the body fat on your belly. What about toning? <laughs> A muscle can do two things. It can get bigger, it can get smaller. It does not get more toned. The appearance of toned is having enough muscular development to actually see the muscle and low enough body fat to see the muscle. And if ladies, you're worried about getting too hypertrophied, just once you reach the level of muscle mass you like, don't lift any harder. The appearance of toning that people go for is generally losing body fat and or building muscle. And you just do that by basic means. Like you don't need to use the body wraps or the creams or all these, these other things that tend to be associated with that. All right, that it? That all you got? That's all I've got all right. for now. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, make sure you go subscribe to Lane's channel. He does a lot of this like myth bust uh, style stuff. You do a really good job with that. So if you guys like that type of content, definitely check out his channel. Uh, leave the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you guys all here in the next one. Jeff. There was one I forgot to ask.